You are listening to an exclusive interview on Bass Musician Magazine. The interview starts now. Hey everybody, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with someone who needs no introduction, John Patitucci. <laughs> oh, now, thanks, bro. many of you, uh, if you've been reading and paying attention to Bass Musician Magazine, have noticed that John has been in our pages so frequently that he's got to get a restraining order against us for stalking. <laughs> uh we interviewed him. Jake Cott interviewed him in 2009. Rick Sushow interviewed him in 2013. He's been on our cover. We were at the Bass Bash just earlier this year when he received Yamaha Life Achievement Award with Abraham Labriel. We're always seeing the CDs. John is one of the people I mention frequently when I'm talking to other musicians because he's one of these guys that can play as amazingly on upright as he does on electric. And he makes all of our four string limited brothers howl at the moon because he will go on a six string and play with more than just four strings for all of you that go on about how Jocko only needed four. So with that said, if you want to know more about all of this stuff I've talked about, just do a search on John Patitucci and there's pages of it. You can check it all out. But I wanted to bring us kind of up to date. John is extraordinarily busy. He's doing all kinds of stuff. Tell us, why don't we start talking a little bit? You know, I know the spring off of, off of from here, January. Tell us what you've been up to, John. I've been recording a new record, a solo project. For the last bunch of years, I've been out there with Wayne Shorter's group, with Children of the Light, with Danila Perez and Brian Blade. We did a record. Uh, we've been touring, and I'm doing a lot of reunion stuff with Chick Corea this summer out with the Chick Corea Acoustic Band. Yeah. And the reason why I got back to the house a little later tonight is because I went into the city to David Gage Bass Shop, and uh, I got my old Pullman that I've had since I was 18 and that I recorded a lot of old record, a lot of my career on. I got it all tweaked out and restrung and ready for the tour so yeah. but i had some traffic coming home so it was crazy anyway recently so, i just finished recording we still have to mix it and master a new record it's kind of like a solo album but it's it's different because it has a lot of textual combinations it's acoustic bass solo it's six string bass solo then some things with acoustic bass and six string together there's a track with um a couple of tracks with nate smith on drums nice. any acoustic bass and electric bass or so there's one with all these electric bass it's a festival of funk and it has all these layers of basses and Nate. There's a solo bass track of me playing a Bach Alamon from one of the cello suites. There's a cello and bass choir, eight voice choir that I wrote uh, for my wife and I to record. There's something with what sounds like an Arabic piece with the six string, the hollow body six string with my daughters singing all these clusters with all these dissonances and everything. My daughters are good singers. Wow. So, and, and my oldest daughter, Gracie, is now out in L.A. She just moved there to be a singer-songwriter and do the whole nine yards. So, this was the first time in our lives where I actually had all of them on my record. My wife's been on a lot of my records. She's a great cellist. Hmm. So, it's a lot of different colors because I wanted to have a little more production than just a solo acoustic bass or a solo six string. I coupled them. I did some wild sounds. John Davis one of my former students who built the Bunker Studios okay. uh, in Brooklyn. Great studio. He and his partners, Aaron Nevetsi and um, I forget the other guy's name. They built the studio by hand. It's like a it's a beautiful studio. It sounds amazing. We did, we did Brooklyn, the record there. That's what I've been doing, you know, and still touring and then teaching. I have an online school that Artist Works. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting place. It's a, it's a big online school with a bunch of teachers out of Napa, California. Phenomenal. They have this patented video exchange technology where this massive amounts of like, I mean, the curriculum that I wrote and recorded and filmed with them for acoustic bass and electric bass was like giving birth. Yeah. They're really detailed and they really they take you. You have to design your curriculum so you can have somebody pick up the bass and say, this is a bass. It's got four strings, either one of them. This is how you hold it and take them from square one through you know beginner intermediate and advanced with play along stuff and a full curriculum online that they can view 24 7 and for fractional cost of what it would cost to come to my house and study with me absolutely so 
that's a really cool thing. And I've been doing that for a number of years already. And I've also been in education. I've done clinics and seminars for years, but now I was teaching at City College in Harlem for about nine years. Then Danilo Perez, my buddy, who I play with a lot with Wayne Shorter on piano, he stole me to Berkeley College of Music. So I've been up there for, wow, maybe seven years already. And I teach at the Global Jazz Institute, which is an amazing thing for young musicians. From And we have people from all over the world. And we encourage them to develop their folk music from wherever they're from and mix it with jazz and do things. And we also teach them how to serve the community. They go into nursing homes, you know, prisons, and, and uh, deal with orphanages and teach kids who are poor how to play music, and like in Panama and in the Dominican Republic. And so it's socially minded, it's mission minded. And we're at the same time challenging them and putting them through a rigorous music curriculum. So we're trying to help them develop as people and artists and also hopefully be part of a change in this world towards serving and taking care of people as opposed to a lot of the negative stuff we see in the world right now. Musicians, I think, have, have been on the forefront with the advantage that there is no linguistic limitation. Music is a universal language. And so oh. wherever you are, you can grasp and enjoy music. But in addition to that, transcending the man-made borders and the, the cultural, instead of shunning the cultural differences, actually embracing and incorporating and that's it the rest of humanity should be learning from the musicians and say hey let's let's not exclude let's right. include and evolve and move ahead so that that's just wonderful work and it's always so exciting to hear it's fun too oh totally well and and it's part of the ongoing process of even your own evolution, I'm sure, because so many musicians, when I'm talking to them, when they hear a little gem or a little something coming from some other place, they'll go, wait a second. That, I mean, Arabic scales alone, you mentioned kind of an Arabic tone. You go, okay, well, that's really cool. You know, you know I did my uh, Ancestry.com in recent years. And I knew I was heavily laden with Italian because both sides are Italian. But but as you go back, you see there was stuff from East Africa mm -hmm. and all of the Middle East, too, in my blood. And it was it was no surprise to me because whenever I've traveled all over the world and, I've, and I'm one of those schizo musicians who likes to kind of play in all kind of different styles. And I really, you know, when I would ever hear when I would hear ever hear one of those real Arabic singers, whether they were, you know, singing from the top of a mosque mm -hmm. or on a record or, you know, whatever. I was always moved by the sounds. And I'm a man of, you know, I have strong beliefs. I'm a, I'm a Christian and uh, I've been for a long time. But I believe that if you're really going to say you're walking a spiritual walk, then you have to love and serve people. And not just the people who think just like you. Mm -hmm. Everybody. So and you can learn from that. So if so, I I've been that way musically as I am spiritually. I'm really into respectful dialogue and loving interactions, as opposed to you're here, we're here, we don't like you, you should be like us. Yeah. You know that doesn't work, and that's not the message of true spirituality anyway. Well, and and at this particular time in our history, it this kind of effort could not be better received. I think. My gosh, yeah, we need it bad. By the world population. But let's go back to this this project. When when are we looking at potentially being able to hear it? Well, we're looking towards a January release, January, February, okay. around the turn of the new year, because we want to make sure we have time to ramp up and promote it right. And since it's going to be on Three Faces, our label, same as Brooklyn was, that kind of really set something in motion in my life that, you know, the conventional record deals were not you know they were hard to get anymore and the budgets were low and and they they were not so great for the musician anyway yeah so i had a very good friend in the record business who's a great musician i can't tell you who it is but he, he said well because you're my friend i would counsel you to just do it yourself yeah. and do it on your own independent label you're going to do better 
because you already have people that have been following you for a while. You've got, you know, I mean, at that point, I already had 13 records out or something like sure. that. Sure. So it's interesting. This will be 15, I think, because I did a small vinyl record of Brazilian music for a record company called Nouvelle. It's called Irmãos de Fé, hmm. and that's called Brothers in Faith. And it's with Rogério Bocato from Brazil and Yotam Silberstein, who's from Israel. Wow. And who's an expert on Brazilian music. <laughs> Again. He's another one who's wide open. So, yes, yes. Um, and he plays with a lot of people, as I have been blessed to play with a lot of Brazilians and South Americans and Central Americans and people from Africa. You know, I, I played with a lot of different people from all over the map. And so anyway, I'm, I'm coming out with this record. And it's interesting and it's different. And it was originally inspired by Dave Holland, the great bassist, who made a solo bass record in 1979 or something called Emerald Tears on ECM. But that's just acoustic bass the whole way. It's beautiful. But I wanted, I'm also play electric, so I wanted to incorporate both. But I also wanted to blend the two and do different things like the octet with the bass and the celli and uh, different sounds. I have a thing with my daughter singing in these clusters. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose the title Sarab, which means like a, a mirage. When you're in the desert, you think you see a city or water. Or, yes. You know, it's kind of like one of these kind of filmic, you know, like a, like a, it's, it sounds like it should be in a film, uh, that kind of vibe, you know. So I, I like all kind of different sounds. And I'm trying to um, do something a little different because I, I didn't want to make a quote-unquote bass record for just bass players. I just want to make a music record utilizing the instruments that we love. Sure. But with a different purpose in mind. With your sound, again, Yamaha you've been playing and you've got signature bass with them, which you've had for quite some time. I know that's been kind of an evolution. Tell us uh, a little bit about that process. You know, I was lucky. I got with them many years ago in the, I guess, later part of the 80s into the 90s. So it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and they've always been really good to me. And uh, they, you know, I got into designing instruments with them. And that red six string, the JP2, whatever, TRB JP2, mm -hmm. that thing, I, I was playing it for, I don't know, like 18 years or something like that. And um, Ken Dupron has been working for Yamaha for decades, who's part of YGD, uh, Yamaha Guitar Development and everything. And now they have a big, new, beautiful building in uh, up in Calabasas, California. And they have, and you know, he he was one of the guys who was instrumental in working with me to get me on board with Yamaha. There was also a couple other guys, Mr. Hagiwara, who was a famous drum but drum guy who signed Steve Gadd and way back, and all these guys in the '80s, late '80s. I signed with them partly because of my association with with you know a big really key to it was the electric band with Chick Corea. Mm -hmm. We were all mm -hmm. Yamaha guys at first. It was just Dave Weckl and me and Chick, all Yamaha. And that's why uh, the, the big drum guy, Hagiwara, Mr. Hagiwara was telling them, you need to sign this guy. Yeah. He's, you know, he and Dave are a team and, you know, all this stuff. So they did sign me. And that's how I got to know uh, Ken Dupron. He was part of that. So we designed that red bass, the JP2. We designed the preamp first time I ever did a preamp with someone, mm -hmm. spectrum mm -hmm. analyzer, you know, at the crib here and going through all the frequencies and setting them where we like. And it's really cool, you know, deciding on all the fees. So that bass, I loved it so much. I played it forever. Yeah. And finally, Ken was saying, well, why don't we do something new? So that's when I, you know, we designed this big semi hollow that Pat Campolitano hand built that thing. And it's on the cover of the Brooklyn record and all over that record. That bass sounds huge. And it's, one of the most exciting things that that's come along a long in a long time for me on the electric, because mm -hmm. it has this warmth and big. That thing has a slab of mahogany down the center. Mm -hmm. It's like a bass bar from an acoustic bass. It's massive sounding. It's not a wayfish six string that only plays chord melody. No, it's got huge bottom, like yeah. massive. So it's kind of like my cake and eat it too bass. All everything that I love, right there, and uh, but it is heavy. <laughs> so we're not sure what to do. We, we've been tossing around ideas how to develop a model that incorporates the semi-hollow thing. And you, you, you've seen, if you've seen any of the recent shots 
since the Brooklyn record, I also have a thinner, smaller version of that semi-hollow. Gotcha. That uh, they made too, but nothing, nothing is a uh, a production thing yet. We're talking. We're trying to figure out what to do. And unfortunately, as we all age, weight starts really being a noticeable thing. I know that. Uh, I, I talk to a lot of the 18 year olds that are playing on those mahogany Thunderbirds and stuff, and I'm going, oh no, <laughs> there's no, no yeah. way I could do this unless I'm sitting down. You know, find a stool or something because I'm I'm not standing for this. But... No, and, and then they wear them really low, like the rock and roll way, which is, oh yeah, so it's got this big weight hanging way down, and it's it looks cool, but I don't see how you can play. I could never play that low, <laughs> like. I don't even know how to play the bass that low. <laughs> so I guess I'll never look cool, but what can I tell you? There you go. Well, and it's interesting <laughs> to see how the instrument continues to evolve. And it's it's thanks to the efforts of the Luthiers. We spoke with Pat uh, briefly at the last NAM show, and they're so enthusiastic. And, you know, taking the concept that the musician is bringing them and turning it into something concrete and tangible that – when it actually comes to life, it, it is. It's kind of like Frankenstein's monster. You don't know until it really just gets going there. Looking ahead, I know you were, you'd mentioned some potential touring and, and again, the CD release. What other projects are, are, are you looking forward to, man? I, I keep writing large form music, too. Like I've written some course, uh, orchestral things that I want to get played. I'm also involved in a project with the uh, Harlem String Quartet. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna do some, we're gonna do a concert in Chicago and Ravinia about a year from now, the Ravinia Festival. So they're an amazing string quartet and they play a lot of jazz influence stuff and all kind of music. So I have something that I wrote, I was commissioned to write by another string quartet. It's about a, it's about a half an hour piece by the Daedalus Quartet that I, I played, performed with them in Philly and, but, um, I still have this piece sitting around and Harlem expressed interest in wanting to play it too. We'll probably play it on the road. And then I'm doing some arrangements of tunes, like um, jazz tunes. I'm doing, I did an arrangement of Bud Powell's Tempest Fugit. Uh, I'm going to probably do Chick Corea's Armanda's Rumba. I'll do a couple of tunes of mine. One being a Shoro, which is crazy, called Shoro Luoco from a record called Communion, I think that is on it. Yeah. So... And I did a I did an arrangement of Coltrane's Countdown, which oh, is crazy. Cool. They wanted to burn, you know. So I said, okay, well, okay. So we did, we're doing Countdown, and I don't know. That's going to be crazy. Uh, string quartet and bass. Wow. You know? So I'm writing. You know, I continue to to cross over to the classical thing. I play chamber music sometimes, and concerts, and you know, like some of the more repertoire like the Schubert's trap quintet with the bass, acoustic bass with the mm -hmm. extension, mm -hmm. and, you know, all that. I'm continuing to try to evolve in, in that area of my playing too. So it's, it's kind of like schizo. I mean, you know, trying to develop as an electric player, acoustic, jazz, classical mm -hmm. music, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes I think I'm just, you know, out of my mind for trying to do all this stuff, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's, it, that is, we're the fortunate recipients of all of your frenzy uh, <laughs> in, 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 in efforts. Now, as you mentioned electric, also we should probably talk just a little bit with amplification because you're an Aguilar player. Yeah, I love it. And it's a company run by bass players. Yeah. And, and so both amplification and you'd mentioned something about uh Yeah, they, they pickups. also, in the new... Semi hollows that we've done, we used Aguilar preamps and pickups. And I, I gotta say also, there's another bass that Yamaha came out with recently that I'm playing. It's a five string, it's called the Broad Bass. Okay. And it's like got a PJ combination. And man, that thing sounds so huge. It's like a P bass on steroids. You know, it's like really. And I was using that at the show too. When I played the five string with the flat wounds on it, mm -hmm. it was that. I love that. And it's not an expensive bass. And it sounds amazing. You know, we're toying with different ideas to design things that are also very affordable that sound great. 
Excellent. So we're, we're going to see what we can come up with. But the Aguilar people have been great, too. They've been really supportive. And the amps sound great, and the speakers. They're really warm, mm -hmm. and they're a throwback. You know, it kind of has feels, it feels like those old beautiful, you know, tube things of the back of the day with the big giant amp pegs and the little B15Ms. And the... we, we get back to an issue of weight, though. Because yeah. they, they used to be so huge that you needed a team of other people to carry them for you. Yeah. And especially if you're in a flat in New York where you've got to deal with any stairs or anything like that, you know, forget about it. It's, it's, it's crazy. That's about the Aguilar. You know, you can have one of those little tone hammers and a little 12 that's super featherweight. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. And yeah. if people want to know what's going on, the best place to keep track of your activity, this frenzy, all this of stuff, johnpatitucci.com. That works good, yep. And um, there's some stuff on there, and uh, and if they visit the artist work site, the you know the, the yes. blonde light yes. school, always stuff going over there. Um, I do have, you know, I try to put some stuff on Facebook and Instagram. My my wife and my daughters are always getting after me about that because, you know, it's hard for me to do too much on that. It's it's a lot of time. Well, John. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking time out of such a busy schedule to bring us up to date. Folks, you've seen him here, direct via Skype, <laughs> John Patitucci, coming to you on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks for basing out with us here on BassMusicianMagazine.com.